Snowtracks Television, going strong for 25 years. Snowtracks is sponsored by Skidoo Snowmobiles. Experience that Skidoo feeling. Yamaha, conquer snow. And by FXR Racing, maximum versatility for all conditions. Unless you've had the privilege of visiting BRP's Austrian engine manufacturing facility, you may not completely understand just how technologically sophisticated Rotax has become. Rotax builds all of Ski-Doo's, Sea-Doo's, and Can-Am's on-road, off-road, and marine power plants in a manufacturing facility which is, quite literally, state-of-the-art. Think about snowmobiling's first direct injection induction system. E-Tech has revolutionized the snowmobile two-stroke engine. Rotax has developed other technologies, some proprietary and some mainstream. One example is coating aluminum cylinders with sprayed-on molten metal instead of using pressed-in steel liners. This saves a ton of weight. This story isn't about two-strokes. It's about Rotax four-stroke power plants, specifically the ACE advanced combustion engine now being used in virtually every BRP power product division when it was introduced in both 600cc twin cylinder and 900cc triple cylinder normally aspirated configurations Maybe you're considering four-stroke power for your next sled purchase. Pay attention here because much has changed at Skidoo from 2019. ACE engines are highly efficient as a result of their four valve per cylinder design and the use of double overhead camshafts. They are also built using a myriad of lightweight casting techniques and more importantly, are purpose-built for power sports applications. Snowmobiles demand much from their engines and in particular, from four-stroke power plants when exposed to continual full-throttle high RPM use. The ACE series of engines use a stout forge crankshaft in normally aspirated applications and a super strong turbo-only crank and rods. Recently, all eyes have been on the new 900cc turbo engine used across all of Skidoo's product line for model year 2019. This engine produces power rivaling the most powerful two-strokes from any OEM. The new Turbo Ace graphically demonstrates Rotax's ability to innovate and manufacture cutting-edge turbo technology. Rotax does not rely on a vendor to provide turbochargers for the Ace engine. They have invested heavily in the design and manufacture of a proprietary turbo unit using a nickel alloy impeller and an innovative mounting orientation, positioning the turbo unit as an integral part of the exhaust manifold. This turbo placement contributes materially to drastically reduce turbo lag. BRP's product planners from virtually all divisions have called on Rotax to ready numerous variants of the versatile A600 twin and 900 triple. Of course, Skidoo continues to use these two ACE platforms in model year 19 with an additional five horsepower added to the non-turbo 900 triple, bringing it to a claimed 95 horsepower. Interestingly, BRP's wildly successful Spark Sea Dew personal watercraft uses both the Ace 60 horsepower twin and the 900 horsepower Ace triple. In case you hadn't heard, the Spark is the largest selling personal watercraft in the world. It's no coincidence the all new Can Am X3 Maverick Turbo uses the Ace 900 Turbo for motivation. In an interesting move in this application, the 900 Turbo produces 172 mind-boggling horsepower. That's 22 more ponies than the Ace Turbo is allowed to deliver in any Skidoo model this season. Obviously, the Ace Turbo can and will produce more horsepower in snowmobile applications in the future. BRP's chassis engineers and Rotax engine design people have put their collective heads together to capitalize on the Ace engine lineup. We can't think of another OEM in the power sports industry that's levering more applications out of what is essentially one engine platform. To prove this point, look at the legitimately revolutionary all new Can-Am Spider Riker Roadster. It debuts with both Ace 900 and Ace 600 power for motivation. 
Skidoo produces and sells more four-stroke snowmobiles than all their competition combined. This means in 2019, the Ace Engine is the largest selling four-stroke power plant in the snowmobile industry. With the 600 Twin, the 900 Triple, and 900 Triple Turbo Ace, four-stroke and two-stroke shoppers have a ton of choices for powering their rides. Skidoo is the largest manufacturer of snowmobiles in the world, and for a number of good reasons. One reason is Rotax's ability to offer legitimate alternatives to two-stroke power in model year 2019. Say snow bike, and most people respond with, oh, you mean a timber sled. Certainly the most recognizable brand in the industry, timber sled has taken things to a whole new level since their grafting into the Polaris company. Manufacturing processes, quality of design and innovation has all exponentially increased in the last few years. And the aero, well, this is the future of snow bikes. Now, because I want to talk less about the power plant itself and more about the actual timber sled kit, I won't be speaking to the bike. I'll be talking about the characteristics of the Aero. You can hook up a Yamaha, Husky, KTM, or a Beta, and you're going to have some slight variations. But truthfully, 450 to 500 cc four-stroke bike power in this category, it's pretty similar. However, the kit that you hook up to that power plant, yeah, that's where the rubber hits the snow. Today, I'm testing a 137 timber sled Aero kit in the base Aero form, but along for some of the photos, we have a 137LE model as well as a 120SX. While saying base model sounds a little bit cheap, it's anything but. The Aero kit, when you go to LE, only comes with a little bit better shock package as well as some graphics and paint. So if you didn't snow check an Aero LE, don't feel bad. A graphics wrap will make you look like you did. But truth be told, the standard Fox Zero Pro shocks offer lots of adjustability and most importantly, deliver a great ride. While I'm riding with the optional TSS under seat shock, it's not a necessity, and the rear skid compliance is exceptional even without it. To say that the rear of the kit is where the big news is for the Aero would be a complete lie. Truthfully, it's both the front and rear that makes this thing so much better than its predecessors, and probably the best in the business. The integration of the one-to-one -one ratio of ski width to track width is a huge improvement. Kits of old would push a smaller ski width through the snow and not cut a true path for the track. Now the Aero Ski is a whopping 11.5 inches wide and establishes the same patch the track will take, allowing for more precise carving and powder and better stability and tracking on side hills. While in fresh, untouched champagne powder, I don't find a terribly huge difference, it's a slightly more set up snow where it's instantly noticeable. The Aero tracks easier and doesn't feel like it's wandering left to right as much as the older design did. and tracking is now aided by a new Traverse ski with massive keels that help keep you where you're pointed. The tri-keel design has new steel runners to help keep you tracking more efficiently and straighter, but most importantly, to give greater lean angles on hard packed snow. This is especially important for building confidence with new riders as the older design felt unstable and a bit twitchy on the hard packed. While it's not a hard packed riding vehicle, there's many times you need to ride these conditions to get to the good stuff. And when you do get to the deeper snow, there's a host of upgrades that the Aero offers that truly sets it apart from the rest. The new Traverse track is a one inch narrower, still tapered and 2.5 inches at the center lug track that the gear ratio has been updated on to allow for higher track speed, which results in better drivability and performance, even in low gears. Timbersled claims the Traverse track is easier to lean and allows for better steering. And I'd say it's not just better, it's light years improved. When linking this with the 137 inch length I'm on today, I'm blown away just how capable this new kit and track are. Forward bite is not an issue in even the deepest snow, while the treed maneuvering isn't anything I'd complain about at all with the longer track. If I was riding mostly flatlands, I think I'd still go for the 120 though. Now the biggest safety improvement by far on the Aero is the braking system. Every other snow bike kit that I've ridden has suffered from braking issues, so Timbersled rethought the whole idea and came up with a real winner. The fully shielded brake rotor means you don't get a frozen brake that leads to a panic feeling when you reach for some stop and get nothing but bar. Featuring a factory pre-blood system with master cylinder and all, you don't have to reroute the cable and then figure out how to get it bled. It's all done. Just route the cable and bolt on the brake and you're done. The system delivers a much more responsive braking experience and builds confidence even when things get icy and the snow is heavy. This brake stops every single time. 
While the Trio Shock isn't part of the Timber Sled Aero kit, it is on the bike that I'm testing, so we thought that we should walk you through how it handles. Truly the best way to experience an aero kit or any timber sled is with the Trio Shock. It means you don't have to revalve or spring your forks and you can push the front end as hard as the rear. The stability and suspension performance it delivers is straight up exceptional. And while it does add front end weight, you just don't notice it at all. The typical diving of the front end, even when sprung super stiff, is completely gone and the cornering precision without the bobbing that comes from overdriving the front forks, yeah, that's a thing of the past. The arrow now tracks on course, and when you do encounter some frozen junk under the powder, it doesn't react by diving the front end and turning in. It stays much more planted and will drive through obstacles much better. To say that the arrow is a big step forwards for snow bikes, no, this is a giant leap. And if you have a chance to get your butt on one, watch out, because the only remedy is to own one for yourself. Trail Tech is sponsored by Princess Auto, a unique world of equipment, tools, and more. There's many misconceptions when it comes to traction products on your sled and what they are and are not doing. Today, I hope to clear the air of some of these myths and get you pointed in the right direction. Sites such as the Woody's Online Application Guide is a great place to get you started. Right up front, we need to know that there are a lot of preconceived ideas about carbide runners and studs, and many of them are just plain old wrong. The days of 300 studs in our tracks and 20 inches of carbide runner are gone. And thanks to innovative and greater understanding of a snowmobile's dynamics, we're able to not only improve the performance of a snowmobile, but more importantly, and more front and center, increase the safety. And that is truly where the carbide hits the ice. I'll go into greater detail about both studs and carbide runners, but for this week, I'm gonna stick to just carbides. Many people believe that the greater the length of the carbide insert on your runner, the better the steering. But after talking with the folks at Woody's, they're plain old wrong. Woody's offers many different styles of carbide runners, and one of the most interesting differences between them is not the amount of carbide inserted into the host bar, but the shape and diameter of the host bar itself. Woody's offers the host bar in multiple different profiles, and they opened our eyes to one of the hallmark truths about your ski's runner, that the host bar does 90% of the steering work, not the carbide. In hard-packed, non-ice trail conditions, a standard hard-weld host bar without carbide would actually do an excellent job steering your snowmobile. The rounded profile is less aggressive and will turn much smoother, however, can get sucked into other tracks and may cause some level of tracking or darting. The Ace Carbide Runner offers a narrow, flat-sided host bar that cuts its own groove and causes the ski to have a more aggressive keel. Woody's offers multiple options for host bar diameter as well as host bar profile, but possibly one of the more popular options of the past five years is the Dooley and the Slim Jim. These twin profile runners go a long ways in changing the steering dynamics of your sled. Keep in mind that the host bar is doing most of the steering work, but now we have two profiles instead of just one on a single runner. But also keep in mind that with these two profiles, you have two per ski for a grand total of four, which is displacing your weight over a much greater area. Because of this displacement, the dually featuring dual round host bars became increasingly popular with touring riders on four-stroke snowmobiles. With the front end weight increased, the dual pattern along with the larger contact area meant riders would experience easier steering effort and reduced darting. However, the lower pressure on each host bar also caused some pushing in corners when the aggressive rider was pushing the snowmobile harder and higher ground speed. To solve this problem, the Slim Jim Dooley Carbide Runner was designed. It uses a square profile host bar that cuts down and pierces through the snow and hooks up much better at higher speed. The Slim Jim provides aggressive riders with the front end precision that they desire at high speeds. However, because they cut through the snow, they do wear out quicker. With the changes in ski profiles since the days of tringling arms and skis that were way out in front of a snowmobile's mass, manufacturers have also changed the design of ski and increased the rocker while shortening up the keel to try to keep the steering from feeling too heavy. On some ski profiles, like the pilot ski from Skidoo, Woody's found that the front of the carbide host bar would actually wear clean through because the front end pressure being put on the skis. To combat this, the Navigator's ski protector was designed and is now offered for multiple applications. This unique design actually packs the snow ahead of the runner itself, creating a fresh surface for the carbide to cut its own path. It also lifts the front of the ski on top of the snow to help with premature front ski and host bar wear. Now we can't go without talking about the carbide insert itself, because while the host bar does do a lot of the steering work, the reality is the carbide's there for more than just protecting the host bar from prematurely wearing out. And surprisingly, that is one of the design elements of the carbide. 
But when you get off the fresh groomed snow and into an icy corner, hard pavement, or frozen lakes, the carbide does play a bigger role. This is the 10% of the time when having a carbide is imperative to keeping you safe and your riding experience enjoyable. Because our industry is primarily studying just the center of the track and not the outside cleats, we can now get away with much less carbide because snowmobiles don't push as they did when studded across the entire track surface. If you want your sled to feel like it's locked on rails, you're gonna be the person who still enjoys an eight inch insert per ski. However, because of the rocker, most times only 30% of that carbide will actually be contacting the trail. The average rider still finds four or six inches to be more than enough carbide with many four-stroke riders using the Dooley or Slim Jim products to reduce steering effort. Make sure you stay tuned to next week's episode where I'm gonna talk more in depth about studs and how they affect your sled's complete traction package. And they do a whole lot more than just adding performance, but more importantly, keeping you safe out on the snow. Closed captioning of snow tracks is sponsored by Triton Trailers, built for adventure. It wasn't really that long ago that a mountain sled was literally just a trail sled with slide rail extensions and a longer track. Maybe a mountain bar on the handlebars for those really extreme models. But today, a mountain sled is a laser-focused vehicle designed for one purpose and one purpose only. Traverse the steepest and deepest conditions requiring the least amount of effort possible. And we've seen some pretty interesting innovations in the mountain segments over the past few seasons from structural components made of carbon fiber to 174 inch track lengths with three inch lugs to articulating skid frames, it all leaves you wondering what might come next. Lucky for you, you don't have to wait any longer for the answer to that question. Arctic Cat has taken mountain sled technology to a whole different universe in 2019 with the introduction of its Alpha One rear suspension system. To say it's different would be an understatement. The real question is though, does it work? So what is Alpha One? Well, simply put, it's a single beam or single rail skid frame, but the simple description doesn't even come close to doing it justice. Instead of two rails connected by cross shafts and axles with all the guts connected on the inside, the Alpha One is a single beam with two slide rails on the bottom and all the components of the skid frame connected on either side, including the wheels, shocks, and linkages. If you're wondering how the track is supposed to stay flat when you're side hilling, it's not. The track is all new, and it's an integral part of the Alpha One system. Obviously, having clips and windows down each side of the track wouldn't work. Instead, the track has a double row of windows and clips down the very center. The outside of the track is solid. The track itself is designed to twist from side to side as the sled leans, which is a tiny bit like what Skidoo's T-Motion does, but in a completely different way. And at a completely different level. When you pull an Alpha One on its side, the track stays flat on the ground with the sled at nearly a 45 degree angle. After spending a lot of time on T-Motion equipped skidoos, I can say that they were, until now, the easiest mountain sleds to get on and keep on their side during a side hill. Alpha One just took over that title in a big way. The question I get asked most about the Mountain Cat Alpha One is will the extreme angle at which the track can flex cause the rear end of the sled to wash out on extremely steep side hills? So far with the testing we've done, the answer is both yes and no. I've definitely felt it wash out at times, but I've also held some crazy steep side hills without it washing out. Articat claims one of the major benefits to the system is that the track will stay flat against the hill during a side hill, providing more traction. So my comments on this topic are simply this. Yes, it does wash out more often than a sled with a rigid skid frame like an RMK, but you get more traction driving you forward and driving you upward. So to me, it's a wash, and whether or not this is a benefit is gonna depend heavily on your riding style and your personal preferences. The first thing that popped into my head when I saw the Alpha One setup was that there's no way it's strong enough to handle hard riding without bending. Luckily for all of us, the engineers at Arctic Cat had considered this from day one. The center rail of the Alpha One is made out of a hollow section of aluminum, which means it's extremely strong, stronger than if it were a solid piece. The front hub, which is where the wheels, the shocks, and all of the linkages connect to the front, is made of magnesium. And it's bonded to the rail in such a way that it can absolutely never come apart. And if you think about it, the forces on the rail itself are less than the forces on a traditional skid frame because the wheels are so close to the center, not way out on the edges. It's a tough one to wrap your head around, but so far it's proven to be a solid piece of equipment that not even Rob and Dave can break. All right, here we go. There are obviously many benefits to Alpha One, but one of the biggest is weight savings, and it comes in two parts. 
First, the track and skid frame itself in a 163 inch length is a full 12 pounds lighter than a traditional setup of the same specifications. Think about that, 12 pounds. How much would you have to spend to shave 12 pounds off your current mountain sled? Articat did it in one fell swoop. The other aspect of weight savings is one I had never considered, but makes perfect sense when you really stop and think about it. Whether it's stuck to the skid frame and its components or just trapped inside the confines of the skid itself, this snow can weigh up to 50 pounds and every time you move that sled, the snow has to go with it. Alpha One has less than half the surface area of a traditional skid frame for snow and ice to attach itself to, but more importantly, there's nowhere for snow to be trapped inside a skid frame. It simply falls out of the track as you ride, which means you're carrying less weight every time you move the sled. Is Alpha One the be-all and end-all of mountain snowmobile design? Probably not. We're sure there's a lot more innovation coming in this segment in the future. What it is, though, is a fresh new approach to something that's been done the same way for decades. Time will tell if this is something that mountain riders as a whole latch onto, but if the obvious benefits alone amount to anything, we're definitely sure this is going to change how we look at the mountain skid frame and the mountain sled as we know it. Snow Tracks has been sponsored by Polaris Snowmobiles, MBRP Power Sports, Race Inspired, Trail Proven, and by the Wide World of Arctic Hat. If you enjoyed the video that you just watched, like it and then subscribe to our page for more great content from Snowtracks TV.